Okay, good morning. Um, today, we are going to be looking at the 2010 AP English Literature and Composition Free Response Question. So we're looking at uh, question two from 2010 um, exam. And we're gonna be continuing to look at question two um, for the duration of these uh, lectures, because as we know, that's what's going to be on the AP exam this year during the coronavirus um, on May 13th. So this is um, different than the last one that we looked at. It's, uh, I think, more complicated and a little bit more difficult. Last time we looked at We Are the Mulvaney's, which I think is quite a uh, accessible text. And this is a, a much older text. It's written in 1801. So it's going to have a very different uh, style to it um, than the last one that we looked at, which was a modern novel. So let's read the prompt to start with. In the following passage from Maria Edgeworth's 1801 novel, Belinda, the narrator provides a description of Clarence Hervey, one of the suitors of the novel's protagonist, Belinda Portman. Mrs. Stanhope, Belinda's aunt, hopes to improve her niece's social prospects and therefore has arranged to have Belinda stay with the fashionable Lady Delacour. Read the passage carefully, then write an essay in which you analyze Clarence Hervey's complex character as Edgeworth develops it through such literary techniques as tone, point of view, and language. So right away, we're given a, a big hint in this prompt because we're told what literary techniques that we should look at. So that's very helpful. It doesn't mean that that's all you could look at. If you see something else that you feel that you can write about in a more effective way, by all means, choose that but at least here we have something to be looking for as we're doing the reading. We're given, um, this is something that you, you never know whether they're gonna give a prompt that leads you in such a strong direction, but when, when they do, um, it's obviously helpful, but you need to be prepared for the fact that they won't do that, that they'll just say uh, with through literary techniques. But anyway, let's take a look first at this, prompt a little bit more detailed. So 1801 is the novel. So like I said, this is a, an old novel. It's over 200 years old. It's going to have a very different style than what we looked at last or than a, a modern novel that you might be reading now. And the novel's title is Belinda. And Belinda is also the name of the protagonist. So first of all, let's just look at this word suitor. A suitor is a boyfriend, is someone who's interested in um, another person's hand in marriage. So you almost always you think of suitors as male. Um, and the protagonist in this case is the main character and the main character who's um, of this novel is named Belinda. And she has an aunt named Mrs. Stanhope who is hoping to improve her niece's social prospects. So again, uh, she wants her niece to um, be upwardly climbing in society. And so in order to, to have this upward mobility, um, she has uh, her niece stay with someone presumably more wealthy than Belinda and someone who can um, introduce her to the right people and help her to gain a, a good, a successful hand in marriage. So again, we're gonna be looking for tone, point of view, and language as we read through this. And we're looking for um, how Harvey's complex character. So we know that he's going to have, this is something that we've seen again and again, we always almost run into that word complex. So again, I'm just gonna reiterate, 
that we're looking for possible duality in his personality. Um, and at the least, we're looking for um, a variety of personality traits. So if not duality, at least variety. Um, so let's get started. Clarence Hervey might have been more than a pleasant young man if he had not been smitten with the desire of being thought superior in everything and of being the most admired person in all companies. So he might have been more than a pleasant young man. He could have been nice if he had not been smitten, and that means taken, kind of in love, with the desire of being thought superior in everything and of being the most admired person in all of companies. So right away, we do see some tone. There's something here that's kind of funny. Um, it's a, a little bit ironic. Um, he could have been a nice guy, but he, but he's, um, but, but he, if he hadn't wanted to be superior in every single thing and the most admired person in all companies. So it's kind of like um, a put down and at the same time, it's a, uh, it's a compliment. So there's a little bit of a compliment in there that quickly gets taken away from, by a put down. Um, he had been flattered with the idea that he was a man of genius. And he imagined that as such, he was entitled to be imprudent, wild, and eccentric. He affected singularity in order to establish his claims to genius. So that's a kind of an interesting com um, sentence. He affected singularity. What does that mean? It means that he once, he affected, he put on the idea of singularity. So he wants to be unique, wants to be considered special and unique. Um, he does have considerable literary talents by which he was distinguished at Oxford. Oxford is a very um, old, university in England, and it's a very famous one. Um, and it's where all the well-to-do people went at that time, or it was one of just a couple of universities where they went at that time. Um, so he is smart. Um, he had considerable literary talents. So that's a plus for him. Um, and he distinguished himself at Oxford, but he was so dreadfully afraid of passing for a pedant, that when he came into the company of the idle and the ignorant, he pretended to disdain every species of knowledge. So he doesn't want to be thought obnoxious. He doesn't want to be thought someone who is wise in an obnoxious way. That's what it means to be a pedant. Um, that when he came in the company of the idle and the ignorant, he pretended to disdain every species of knowledge. He pretended to disdain. So he's false. He's someone who can put on an act that is not accurate to who he really is. His chameleon character seemed to vary in different lights and according to the different situations in which he happened to be placed. He could be all things to all men and to all women. And that's kind of an interesting dash right there. When we see a syntax, um, the use of syntax that's coming as a change, we definitely want to pay attention to it. And I think what's important here is that um, we're talking about that he can be all things to all men, but maybe even more importantly to all women. And we're going to be talking about a woman because we're talking about the main character, Belinda. So this might be something that we want to just pay attention to, that he's a ladies' man. Okay? And he's a chameleon. He's changeable. 
And so we notice that he can be everything to all people. And um, that means that he is not necessarily all that uh, honest or honest might not really be the right word, but um, he's not transparent um, in who he is. He can change according to the people that he's around and, uh, and more importantly, according to what they want of him. He was supposed to be a favorite with the fair sex and oh, he was supposed to be a favorite with the fair sex. This is important. This word comes up again later on. Um, and it doesn't mean supposed to be the way that we use it today. It means he was thought to be a favorite. He was supposed. So he was thought to be a favorite with the fair sex. And of all his various excellencies and defects, there was none on which he valued himself so much as on his gallantry. So he has high esteem. He thinks of himself highly, and especially his gallantry. And gallantry is, is also is referring to his, um, his, his mannerisms and how his mannerisms are there to uh, protect and support the fair sex is kind of the idea of your gallantry, that you're um, a man of honor, but also one who's going to protect, in, in this case in 1801, what they called the fair sex, which is women. Um, so he was not profligate. He had a strong sense of humor and quick feelings of humanity. So what this word um, means is like desolate or wasteful. So he was not um, a scoundrel. He was not a wasteful person. He had a strong sense of humor and quick feelings of humanity. So again, here's something that sounds kind of positive. All of these things sound kind of negative about him, but here's something that you can't say is bad. But then the word but, just like before, we saw the word if, and those words are giving us a little bit of a, a, a pause, but, so he, he has quick feelings of humanity, but wait, he was so easily led, or rather so easily excited by his companions, and his companions were now of such a sort that it was probable he would soon become vicious. Okay, so he has feelings of humanity, but he could be vicious. That's, that's kind of a strong word. There's some foreshadowing there of what might come in the future um, with this word vicious. And what is it about himself that he's easily influenced by other people? Okay, this is very dismissive. Um, when the author uses the word but, the narrator, I should say. Um, and I, I want to also make sure that I'm clear that I didn't say the author, but rather the, the narrator of this piece. And that um, we were talking about point of view. We're talking about tone and language and point of view, or we haven't started talking about it yet, but that's what we're looking for. And this point of view um, is a third person point of view. And so far, it's hard to know whether it's limited or omniscient, but it seems that he has a very uh, good understanding the narrator, um, whether it's a he or she, the narrator has a good understanding of this character um, and has strong opinions about this character, right? It's, uh, he, he knows this character in a complex way um, and he's describing him in a complex way. But remember the tone is negative so far. It's, um, it's uh, critical and judgmental of this person. Um, who seems to want more than anything to be well-liked, um, but who also can be, can be 
easily influenced by others. As to the connection, as to his connection with Lady Delacour, he would have started with horror, started with horror. So this means um, pulled back. You know, um, the acted, acted uh, astounded with horror. Um, but in her family, he, oh, he would at the idea of disturbing the peace of a family. But in her family, he said, there was no peace to disturb. He was vain of having it seen by the world that he was distinguished by a lady of her wit and fashion. He was vain of having it seen. So he cares what other people think of him. And Lady Delacour is rich and fashionable. So he, he wants people to know that he's he's a favorite of hers that he was distinguished by her that he's one of her um, good friends but look at this he would have started with horror at the idea of disturbing the peace of a family but in her family he said there was no peace to disturb so he'd like people to think that he would never cause trouble but in this case he's saying it it's okay because there's nothing to, there's nothing to, um, to uh, disturb in her family. There's no, um, he would never do, he's saying that he would never do something, but in this case he will do it. So he'd never do X, but he will do Y. So um, if you see, he was vain of, that he was distinguished by a lady of her wit and fashion, and he did not think it incumbent on him to be more scrupulous or more attentive to appearances than her ladyship. So something's going on there between them and he feels that it's okay. Um, and it, it's kind of saying here that um, he's willing to put her reputation at risk as long as she doesn't care. So it's implying that in this case, there's an implication that something might be going on between him and Lady Delacour that might not be 100% um, above board. And why I say that is because of the next sentence. By Lord Delacour's jealousy, he was sometimes provoked, sometimes amused, and sometimes flattered. So again, you can see how his emotions, his responses to other people change. Um, he, he's someone who is, um, who is, has different responses at different times. Sometimes he's provoked, sometimes he's amused, and sometimes he's flattered. So sometimes he's upset, sometimes he's amused, and sometimes he just feels good by her ladyship's, her husband's jealousy. So that means he's flirtatious with the lady. And that's what he was talking about that um, before her, uh, that he didn't have to be more scrupulous. So he's willing to put her reputation at risk. So that's, that's kind of important about his personality. He was constantly at all her ladyship's parties in public and private. Consequently, he saw Belinda almost every day. So here's our main character is finally coming in. Um, and he was constantly at of all her parties. That means at all her parties. And every day he saw her with increasing admiration of her beauty and with increasing dread of being taken in to marry a niece of the catch match maker, the name by which Mrs. Stanhope was known amongst the men of his acquaintance. All right, so here it says he had increasing admiration of her beauty 
but increasing dread. So there's a, a, a time where his feelings seem to be in contradiction to each other. Right, there's a contradiction. How can you having, why, why is he having increasing admiration, but also increasing dread of being taken in? So he doesn't want to be made a fool of. To be taken in. Um, and by what? Taken in by the, by the ant who is a matchmaker. So that's also kind of important, something that we're understanding about Belinda, um, that she has an ant and who is maybe, um, who's a matchmaker, but maybe in a, a way that moves people from one part of society to the next. Because remember in our prompt, we saw that there was something about um, this aunt that was hoping that Belinda was gonna marry maybe above her class, above her status. So she was getting her into a social circle that included Lady Delacourt. Um, young ladies who have the misfortune to be conducted by these awful dame, artful dame, sorry, that's important, by these artful dames are always supposed to be partners in all the speculations, though their names may not appear in the firm. So in this case, um, young ladies who have the misfortune to be conducted by these artful dames, there's something a little bit strange about this tone. Um, if these are artful dames, why is it a misfortune? And why is the word conducted put in italics there? Um, well, one thing uh, is that their thought, remember this word means thought to be, okay? So are always thought to be partners in all the speculation, so their names might not appear in the form. So what that means is that the, the young ladies that are being made a match of are often thought to be in cahoots with the, the, this woman, Miss Stan Hope, or any woman in her place who's trying to make matches. Um, and this wouldn't have been, a, it's not like this is a job of hers, but just a, maybe a, a hobby of hers to help people to make a match that's going to be uh, positive for them. So in this, when you think about that, you're always thinking about a match that might have to do with upward mobility, that would take someone from maybe upper middle class to, to very, very upper middle class. So it's a, it's a monetary thing that you're making a match to improve your, your financial situation. So what they're saying is that the young ladies who are a part of this are in cahoots with the matchmaker. And that's a, that's a put down of the ladies, right? So he is suspicious. That's, that's what's coming up, is that, um, is that we're seeing that Mr. Hervey is suspicious. Um, if he had not, if, and here's that word, if again, um, if he had not been prejudiced by the character of her aunt, Mr. Hervey would have thought Belinda an undesigning, unaffected girl. But now he suspected her of artifice in every word, look, and motion. So he's very suspicious of Belinda, but um, we look and see that he would have thought Belinda undesigning and unaffected. So we get the feeling that Belinda is a nice girl. Um, she's obviously quite attractive. She said he had increasing admiration of her beauty and that she's undesigning and unaffected. So again, if he had not been prejudiced. So if he could see things clearly, he would have had positive thoughts about her, but he can't. But now he suspected her of an artifice in every word, look, 
and emotion. And I just thought that's interesting because it kind of mimics what they were saying in the first part of the writing, that if he had not been smitten with the desire of being thought, then he would. And if he had not been prejudiced by the character, then he would. So if he wasn't so easily influenced by other people, then he would have had a good impression of Belinda. Um, but now he suspected her of artifice in every word, look and motion. And even when he felt himself most charmed by her powers of pleasing, he was most inclined to despise her. For what he thought such pure, such premature proficiency in scientific coquetry. So in flirting, in flirtatiousness, for what he thought of as a, as a, like a premeditated flirtatiousness. He had not sufficient resolution. He has not sufficient revolu resolution to keep beyond the sphere of her attraction. He can't stay away from her, okay? He doesn't have the strength. He's weak. He doesn't have the strength to stay away from her. Um, but frequently, when he found himself within it, he cursed his folly and drew back in sudden terror. So this is important because it shows that he has a, a lack of character. A lack of character. All right. So let's look at this whole thing together. First of all, I always like to um, put down some of the words that um, we can talk about about him. Pervy. So um, he's a snob. That's evident from the first part of this. Um, he's contradictory. Um, he's suspicious. He's a uh, flatterer. Um, he's opinionated. He's judgmental and we and critical. He's critical. Um, he's weak and conceited. Um, but he's he's well educated, and I do think that's important because that that goes towards the language aspect. Um, another thing, uh, some more things about him is that he's changeable. I know that's not a great word, but he's malleable. He will, um, he's easily influenced and easily persuaded. And he's, it, he's easily persuaded um, and he's impressionable. And he's impressionable. Um, okay, so that's some of the things about him. And that those, those do influence, although these aren't opposites, um, they do show his complexity because he's got all of these personality traits. And we can talk about all of them just from this piece. But let's talk about the narrator. So this is a third person point of view. Um, and this is um, one thing that I wanna talk about in terms of this point of view is that the point of view itself seems a little bit critical. It's a critical narrator, critical of Hervey. So Often when you see third person point of view, you wanna ask yourself about any bias that the narrator, and any narrator, right? If it's first person also, you're always wondering is it an unreliable narrator? And even when it's third person, you wanna know is there some kind of bias? And I think in this case there is, and that's what the tone, that's where the tone comes from. So in this case, um, he is, he's the the narrator feels a little bit judgmental and it makes you ask yourself why is the narrator treating Herbie so harshly 
um, is there something that he's trying to say about, or she, I don't know why I keep saying he as a narrator, um, but it, is there something that the narrator is trying to say about Hervey or about society in general? And if you can get a little bit of what the narrator is trying to say about society in general, then you might be um, approaching something that's thematic. So you're not always going to be able to see, but we did see in the Mulvaney um, prompt that there was something that the narrator was trying to say about death and about life and about the, um, about the, the inevitability of death that that was important and in this case i think that there is something to be said about the society that hervey is from this upper class wealthy well-educated society that possibly um is evidenced by his personality which is also suspicious um opinionated judgmental critical and also um, really cares about what other people think of him. So that's another part aspect to his personality, that he's doing all these things in the first half of the passage that um, show that he cares deeply about what other people think, that he can be anything, remember, all things to all men and all things to all women. So he's very influenced by the society that he's from. So what about the tone? that we see through this third person narrator. Because we don't just wanna talk about tone, we need to be able to say something about the tone. So I would say that the tone is ironic, it's slightly humorous, it's um, judgmental, it's a critical tone. And that's important because that's where the irony comes from because the, the narrator is critical of Hervey and Hervey is critical of other people. Hervey cares so much what other people think and the narrator himself is being quite judgmental um, about this character, right? He's not being shown in a good light. So that's some of the irony that's happening within the point of view. The other thing that we were asked to look at is language. So in this case, I would say the language is elevated. What kind of language is being used to describe Hervey? So it's a high language. Um, it's a formal language. It's a controlled language. Um, it's detailed language. Um, it's an educated, well-educated language. The use of vocabulary, the use of syntax is quite elevated, as I already said. So those are things that help us to understand Hervey because Hervey is a, a snob and he is from a high, um, from a high society. You get the feeling he's well-educated and he is a good friend of Lady Delacour. And he's someone that is being sought after as a suitor for Belinda. So we can assume that he comes from a, from a, from a, a high class of people. Um, uh, an upper class person in the society that's being described. So um, these are some of the things that we can say about him. And we can say that because of the language that's been used and also because of the tone that's been used. And we do get a feeling that there's something critical in the whole piece through Harvey's uh, personality that's also a reflection possibly of the society at that time. So I hope that this will help you to, to look at this piece um, and to write an essay 
about how this complex character is shown through techniques such as tone, point of view, and language. And just one last thing, when you're writing your thesis, don't just say because of tone, language, and point of view. You need to add adjectives because of an ironic tone, because of elevated language, because of third person point of view. You, you want to be specific in your thesis to show that you're not just parroting the prompt back. Okay, you want to make the prompts yours by adding those essential adjectives. Okay, we'll have a good time writing your essay.